The Hemlopoli Delta is considered to be naturalized on the West Coast, and I'm from the West Coast, and when I studied forest entomology, nobody even mentioned it. it was, it's never been a pest. It's never been a problem. The natural enemy complex is very well established. It's very broad. It's very rich. It's under control. I was actually just visiting my parents the other week, and there, enough, there sure enough, there was a Hemlopoli Delta on, on hemlock trees right there in the park. So. Um, is that the same species? Coming? Exactly. No, no, no. It's so it's uh, it's the western hemlock there. That could be another aspect to it. Um, so this is a picture of the adult and the egg. So if you were to look carefully at those fluffy white masses, and you picked away the waxy mass, this would be the adult. And the live ones right now are nice and plump and juicy, and they haven't started putting out eggs yet. Uh, at least the ones I looked at last week. This is what they look like when they start pumping out eggs. When do they do that? Well, well, probably, I don't, you know, it's like I don't have any experience here. This is the first I've really had a chance to look at them. So I'm guessing probably around uh, middle to the end of uh, April. Right now, there's no eggs. So. What's the size of it? Uh, the size is about a millimeter, millimeter and a half. The eggs, less than half a millimeter. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the life cycle, actually, I'm not going to belabor the point. It's actually very complicated for an insect. Actually, there's two host trees. There's hemlock and spruce. In Japan, there's a sexual reproduction on the spruce trees. They don't do it here. The spruces are unacceptable for some reason here. Um, so all we have is the hemlock host. And so it just keeps cycling like this. Uh, the two generations per year. Right now, we're going through the stage, actually, that over, over, over summers <laughs> in the diapause phase. Then right now, we're right about here, where the adults are going to be producing eggs. The eggs hatch. The, uh, this generation uh, disperses in the crawler, the first instar stage, and then uh, reestablishes itself and goes into estivation. Um, no, goes to an adult stage, and these lays again, disperses, and, and uh, goes into estivation or diapause for the summer. There is a certain number of the population that actually is, is, goes and tries to find spruces. It's totally unsuccessful but it's a wonderful way to get rid of bugs around here. And it actually is a, a density dependent thing. So what that does is it sets up population fluctuations uh, of the aphid on the hemlocks. So when it gets really dense, the populations will collapse because a large portion of the population went off looking for spruces, which they won't find. So uh, that, that sets up an interesting population fluctuation. And what you'll do is you'll see them, they'll be really heavy, and they'll sort of seemingly disappear. And you'll think, oh, I'm out of the woods. But then next year, they'll come back and they'll infest the tree just as bad. Um, the crawler, OK, you saw that fluffy egg nest. This is a crawler. That's the dispersal stage. That's one of the problems. It's so difficult to detect this bug. It is really small, less than half a millimeter. It travels easily on wind. They, and uh, uh, they've documented on birds' feet and on the hair of deer and people. Uh, so. Um, the crawler is present after the eggs hatch. I'm guessing around here, probably the end of April through May, and maybe into June, depending. It's very temperature dependent, uh, the hatching. So there is a time period where really you should be aware that if you're carrying around hemlock, you could be the dispersal agent yourself. Um, one of the reasons it's so difficult to detect this insect in the summertime is because after this crawler finally does settle down at the base of the needles, it turns into this little dark dot that is really hard to see. Mm -hmm. And so basically, summertime, forget it. Don't even bother to try and look for them. And that's also why uh, um, uh, it's, like, it's difficult to determine, to detect a very early infestations, because you just you miss these all the time. Um, I might say, OK, more of the life cycle, which is too complicated. Don't bother. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is another picture. There's another interesting insect here, or not insect, it's a mite. It causes this browning of the needles. It can get bad. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be mistaken for the, uh, for the adult. OK, population control, you know, this is just going through biology. Uh, I don't want to bore you. Um, but unsuccessful establishment, the crawlers get blown by the wind and then land who knows where. Winter temperatures are very critical uh, in, in uh, 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 killing the, the aphid. They've, no, they've looked at pop, uh, populations in 
Connecticut, where they've seen temperatures right around minus 20 degrees Celsius, causing up to 95% mortality. Um, we've had temperatures here this winter that were easily at minus 20 degrees, and I've counted over 50% survival. The question in my mind is how are those temperatures moderated by the presence of the lakes? We've already established research sites where we're actually monitoring the temperature gradient going up the hill from the lakes. So we should have answers to that question sometime soon. Um, declining tree health, of course, uh, has a good population control. The density dependent effects I mentioned earlier by, uh, by the having the winged one go off in search of nothing. And then predation by natural enemies. And then we'll, I'll come back to that. Um, impact on the trees, basically, uh, it inserts its stylets into the tree, and then it won't move after that point. What it does is it actually it doesn't feed in the it doesn't eat the sap. What it does is it feeds on the ray cells within the xylem. So what it does is basically it buggers up the conduction of uh, uh, of water and and minerals up to the foliage. Uh, so it's different from other aphids that love to just take the sap out, that nice sugary sap. Um, so it, it basically it eventually kills the foliage and, and reduces the bud production and the elongation for future uh, growth. Um, it reduces radial growth in the tree. It uh, usually kills the tree within four to ten years, but I was talking to someone recently and he said, well, geez, you know, it's like I've been looking here at the University of uh, Massachusetts and I've had a tree out here that's been infested for 15 years. It just sort of plods along. And, I think at the northern range of its distribution, we just don't know enough about what's going on. It could be a non-problem around here. You know, it's like we could lose a few trees and then finally get to the point where it won't be killing them. We just don't know. But we should keep in mind our experience elsewhere that shows that it's a big, big problem. Um, Mark, Mark. But, yeah. if, but if it doesn't kill in 15 years, the tree must look pretty bad. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it doesn't look really great. Yeah, okay. yeah so that's a really good point. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and it may be affecting its reproduction. And it will be re affecting its reproduction, right. And who knows how long. He, he really doesn't know what's going on in that case. He's an entomologist. He should know. <laughs> <laughs> um, it infests all age classes. You know, oftentimes in, in hemlock stands around, you really get big ones that are, uh, that are up in the canopy, and you get smaller ones all the way down. It likes them all. It doesn't, it doesn't discriminate. Um, and uh, it's found throughout the crown on an individual tree, which is actually quite good because that means you don't need to have binoculars and look at the tippy top of the tree to see if it's infested. Basically, all you need to do is look at the bottom, bottom few branches, and that'll tell you if, it, if it's infested or not. Um, so what other stuff? Impact on the forest. These are just a couple, you know, uh, oh my goodness, pictures from uh, of the, the Great Smoky Mountains. It's basically killed the, the hemlocks uh, in, in whole drainages in the Smokies. Mm -hmm. And that's what's really freaking the uh, uh, resource managers out because they've realized the genetic resources of that drainage are gone. And so they're actively out there controlling them. Um, around here, I think it's really important to realize the importance of hemlock because they are in the gorges. And the gorges are really important for the lakes and water.